Thank you, Marianne. And thank you for the, give me the privilege to introduce two very good friends. Uh, those of you who have not followed Houston in the last 10 to 15 years, the city of Houston has really become a power in international relations, in international affairs. First of all, it is the number one global city in the United States. And I say this because by far, the percentage of exports to its GDP surpasses in any other city in the United States by far. But the key of this change has been the education structure here. Rice University, uh, Southern University, and Houston University has gone through a tremendous change in becoming a power in international affairs. And one of the things that has accelerated that growth has been uh, the work of its president, Renu Catoro, and the creation of the Institute for Global Engagement. It started two years ago, and they recruited a top diplomat to head that institute, and it's Ambassador Michael Pelletier, who was ambassador of the United States to Madagascar and the Comoros, but he has a tremendous experience also in being part of the State Department structure, leading the school uh, for that prepares diplomats, and he's been assigned in different positions in Africa Bureau, the State Department in D.C., uh, in Asia, and others. So um, he was recruited two years ago. He's the founding director of the Institute, and in two years, he has changed completely the outlook of the university regarding international affairs. Uh, he uh, is a graduate of Georgetown, a graduate of the Institute of Political Studies in Paris, and the University of Columbia. But if you look at those, those three cities are three of the top international cities in the world. So I think you chose well. He's going to have a conversation with another friend, Ambassador Ken Juster. Uh, in 1988, I was uh, running the government in exile of Panama in Washington, D.C., out of the embassy. It was bizarre. It was unique. The uh, United States did not have any uh, experience in, in harboring governments in exile. Uh, and uh, we had a, a top diplomat lawyer in uh, Washington, D.C., who had experience in the State Department, Bill Rogers. So one day we had a meeting because uh, he was he accepted to take the case of Panama. Uh, you know, every now they, they do all of these it's statistics and metrics. If they have, we have done that in 19, 1988, probably we had come out with not more but 5% possibility of success. I mean, it was crazy. I'm glad we didn't do it because if had we, we probably would quit then. But anyway, Bill Rogers came in with a young lawyer. I thought he was bringing a young lawyer that was just breaking in into the city, into, into the, 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 the. Now, by the way, at those days, I had a lot of gray hair. And Ken, now, I didn't have any gray hair. Today, I do. Ken didn't have any, and now they, he, he does. So I, I don't want to say that it was Panama that created that. But anyway, it was Ken Juster became our point person in Washington, D.C. And he took that fight as it was his own fight. And he did an incredible job in uncharted waters because nobody had any experience about running a government in exile. Afterwards, he was uh, 
uh, special assistant to Deputy Secretary Eagleberger, but he kept the relationship with Panama, the reconstruction of Panama. Then he went back to the law firm, and then he became Undersecretary of Commerce. And as part of the Commerce Department, he became the champion within the administration in promoting the Panama-United States free trade which was a success. Uh, it took two years in, 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 in negotiating, and Ken from the Department of Commerce was an instrumental part on that. By that time, I had created the U.S. Panama Business Council. He, Ken was a founding member um, of the board of the council, and then he went to other uh, fertile grounds. He went to San, San Francisco, in sales.com, uh, uh, then to New York, in Pincus uh, Warbook, uh, and now he's you know, back, went to the, the, the um, White House as a director of international policy, and from there to India as the US ambassador to India. So he's got a very, very interesting uh, career, and I think uh, we all are privileged to have both ambassadors to conduct this um, conversation. And Michael, thank you for choosing Houston to be here. And Ken, I, I think that you thought that the Yankees were going to be in the playoff <laughs> with, with the Houston Astros. You're going to have to wait for the next year. But that gives you, <laughs> I, that gives you a, a reason to come back. Ever since the Yankees lost their Panamanian players, Mariano Rivera and Ramirez, yeah. there you are. they haven't been the same. <laughs> but you, you got to do something about it. Yeah. And, and we notice he's wearing an orange and blue tie, so you're... you're, you're. Yeah. Well, Ambassador Jester, first of all, uh, as many have said, I'm sure welcome to Houston. Thank you. And it's nice to see you again. Thank you. Um, I haven't seen Ambassador Jester since before he went out to India, not in person. And so I'm, I'm really honored and really excited to hear some of his um, some of his impressions and some of his thoughts. I would add to Ambassador Sosa's introduction that since coming back, Ambassador Jester, um, as a distinguished fellow for the Council on Foreign Relations, has also run a series of programs on India and U.S.-India relations, which have been incredibly informative and useful and insightful, and I've benefited a lot. So I thank you for that. Um, I thought we could start with maybe one or two more broad questions to set the context a little bit before delving into some of the detail. And I'll try to be good about leaving um, time um, for questions that they'll, uh, the, our colleagues from World Affairs Council will pass us from the audience towards the end of the evening. Um, but to start, I would just really appreciate your impressions of the growth of the India-US partnership. Um, not all that long ago, it was a relationship which was tense and a little bit suspicious on both sides, and slowly that partnership has grown and grown to really be truly comprehensive. And I just wondered if you could sure. tell us your impressions of that and update us on that. Sure, Michael, I'd be delighted to. Let me just begin by saying what a pleasure it is to be here in Houston, to have the privilege of being introduced by Ambassador Sosa and to see he and his wife, Margaret. We worked very closely together in the late 80s uh, on U.S.-Panama issues, and uh, I really enjoyed that immensely, and I'm very thankful for the confidence that was placed in me. And it's great to see you, Michael. Uh, you were uh, heading the Foreign Service Institute when I was going through ambassadorial training. You had served in India as the Deputy Chief of Mission. We got together, and everything I knew about India, you told me. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, the U.S.-India relationship has truly been transformed since the end of 2000 to today. Uh, in history, uh, the U.S. and India had a cordial but somewhat cool relationship. During the Cold War, India was not aligned, but the United States was an ally with Pakistan, uh, and that made us suspicious to India. And at one point, India wanted some weaponry from the United States when Lyndon Johnson was president, and he turned it down, and they turned to the Soviet Union. And they signed a friendship treaty with the Soviets in 1971. And while we've always had, a, a, again, a cordial relationship, we provided a lot of assistance in agriculture and health and other areas, it was never really close and warm. 
And that changed right at the end of the Clinton administration when President Clinton, who had wanted to travel to India, but actually had to postpone his trip because of the nuclear tests the Indians undertook in 1998, which led to sanctions against India, made a trip to India at the end of his term that was incredibly warm and uh, uh, really started to uh, revive the uh, idea of a closer relationship between the two countries. But it was really then when George W. Bush came in as president in 2001, uh, he had the simple idea, influenced by people who he had met who were Indian Americans, uh, one of which came up to me before the meeting uh, this evening, that the world's oldest and oldest democracy being the United States and its largest democracy, India should have a better relationship. It, it made sense and it was confounding to him that it wasn't as good as it might be. And Prime Minister Vajpayee of India also felt that the US and India were natural allies. And so they began the process of transforming that relationship. And I fortunately found myself at the US Department of Commerce. And not only was I helping to champion the free trade agreement between Panama and the United States, but I was in charge of all of the sensitive technology exports of the United States, what are called dual use items that have both a civilian and a military use. Mm -hmm. And this was a great interest to India as it wanted to develop its economy. Its technology is still a big issue for them today. And so I was in the midst, the middle of uh, trying to transform this relationship along with our ambassador, Robert Blackwell, uh, in India. And we initially formed a high technology cooperation group in which uh, I and India's foreign secretary at the time, Conwell Sibyl, founded and led to see if there's a way we could start to get Indian companies off of what was called our sanctions list or entity list and start exporting sensitive items to them. But we also needed to be assured that India had a way of protecting this technology, of making sure it was used for the purpose that was described and that it didn't end up in the wrong hands. And they had to put in place export controls, which was something they resisted at first. But we created a roadmap, uh, as I said, first through this high technology cooperation group, then through an initiative called Next Steps in Strategic Partnership. And ultimately, this led to what was known as the Civilian Nuclear Deal in 2008. But these were progressive steps. We also started to increase our defense relationship. In 2000, we sold virtually no defense items to India. Today, we have over $23, $24 billion uh, and more of sales. And we started to transform the relationship. And slowly and gradually, it's widened and deepened over the last 23 years to the point that we cover every issue of human endeavor. We have a relationship on defense cooperation, on nonproliferation, on counterterrorism, on trade and investment, on the environment, on energy, on health care, on agriculture, on space. We were talking earlier with students uh, today on space issues, on the oceans, uh, everything. And uh, it has continued to expand despite there being Republican or Democratic administrations the United States and Congress or the BJP in India. It's been one of the few issues of broad bipartisan support. And you saw that Prime Minister Modi had a state visit to Washington in June. And the relationship is uh, really going on all cylinders. But one needs to remember, and I'll come back to this perhaps in some of your other questions, India is not an ally. It's a strategic partner. India has alliances with no one. And so it's somewhat of a special relationship that has its constraints uh, as well as its positive attributes. But the relationship today is in very strong footing, and it's been a steady process over the last 23 years. No, absolutely. And that's actually a good segue to the, the second element that I wanted to sort of hear you speak to um, in terms of a, a change in what's happened in India in particular, which is the growing self-confidence, the growing assertiveness, if you will, of India on the global stage. Um, I think you can really trace that back to Prime Minister Modi's initial election. But it's, it's developed and, and continues. And I think I can see ways in which it poses both opportunities, but also great challenges for its, not its allies, but its partners, as yeah. you said. Well, you know, India, like all countries, is a very proud country. And it, it regards itself as a civilizational power. Its civilization goes back 5,000 plus years. Uh, and they felt that they were uh, mistreated as a uh, colony under the British and before that the Mughals. 
And when they gained independence, it was very important for them that they did not subordinate their interests or their uh, allegiances to any country and that they operated with an independent foreign policy and as a proud country. But they were a very poor country. They had deep poverty and other challenges. And so they might not have been, as Michael was saying, as self-confident on the world stage. They were truly a developing uh, country. Uh, now the economy has grown tremendously. Uh, it's now the world's fifth largest economy. Uh, although on a per capita GDP, it's still mm -hmm. a very poor country because it's the world's largest with over 1.4 billion people. Uh, but it's projected by the end of the decade to be the world's third largest economy. And it's been able to position itself. Uh, it believes India does in a multipolar world, which is a slightly different vision than the United States, uh, in which Russia, China, India, the United States, you know, several countries would be poles in that multipolar world. That's a way for India to have space to conduct its policy and wants to have strong and positive relations with all countries. Uh, and so they've positioned themselves and been able to do it quite successfully under Prime Minister Modi and the Foreign Minister uh, Jay Shankar as a bridge between the North and the South and the East and the West. And you saw this most vividly in their position on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and we can come back to that uh, issue. But they've been able to take a position where after the invasion of Ukraine, where they did not condemn Russia, and they were a bit on their back feet uh, because they were getting a lot of criticism, to the point where all the countries in the world are courting India because they feel a rising India is an important relationship to have in the Indo-Pacific region, both as a counterbalance to China, but also as a growing market and a country that they can operate in and uh, have manufacturing capabilities and the like. So India is uh, on the rise. Mm -hmm. It's a country that is of great interest to others, uh, and it is increasingly confident in terms of its broader policies and has been more active internationally. But as you said, Michael, there are also some limitations that relate to its own view of the world and its own view of what they call strategic autonomy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wonder within that, within that framework of strategic autonomy, um, if there are things that you see or things that efforts that you've seen made to try to I don't want to say steer India, because I think the Indians would take that very wrong, and I don't think that's the right way to present it, but in the way of sort of encouraging policies and positions that we see as being helpful both to India, but also to India playing a constructive role in the international uh, partnerships. Um, one of the things I noted, for example, was during your recent uh, conversation with uh, Minister of External Affairs, Jay Shankar, he talked about the U.S. being an optimal partner of choice in technology. And yet, at some points, you can find Indian policies that really don't optimize that optimal partnership. So I wondered if, there's, if you've seen ways or if you think of ways where that partnership can be strengthened in a more positive sure. direction. Well, let me step back by saying I, there's the feeling in the United States that a strong India mm. and a strong U.S.-Indian relationship is in our interest. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in our interest because uh, we want to maintain a balance and an equilibrium in Asia, and uh, no one wants to get into a conflict with China, but no one wants to see China dominate the region and subordinate all the other countries in it, uh, and then perhaps beyond the region uh, as well. So uh, we have a confluence of interests with the Indians. Mm -hmm. And India itself shares a number of our values in terms of the rule of law, the peaceful resolution of disputes, the desire for freedom of navigation, and freedom of overflight, and freedom of trade. Uh, and there's a tremendous people-to-people -people relationship between mm -hmm. Indians and Americans. There are over 4 million Indian Americans in this country and close to a million Americans in India, often the children of Indian couples when they were living in the United States. So there's a lot that we share in common. But as I said earlier, India perhaps has a different global vision. It mm. would like to reform the world system uh, as we know it. They feel that it's basically a Western-dominated uh, system that came out of the end of the Second World War. And they believe they should have a system that is more uh, consistent with today's world and 
a country of India's size should be on the UN Security Council and have a stronger voice in international organizations. Uh, we have, especially coming out of COVID, seen India as a trusted partner for supply chains, for technology issues. Uh, and we have felt, well, we've had a very strong defense relationship. We can help India by offering to co-produce items in the United States. Of course, India has to make the environment for companies to regulate conducive to that. The United States doesn't produce defense equipment ourselves. We rely on the private sector. Uh, but technology is very critical uh, to India and something that together we can uh, work uh, constructively uh, on. We can, as I say, uh, uh, increase India's defense capabilities. Uh, we can cooperate in uh, health care issues uh, and climate related issues, uh, a whole range of matters, but we have to do it recognizing that every position that we have might not be the same as the Indians have. And in fact, if you look at the United Nations voting, India is with us less than 50 percent uh, of the time. So we have to help build up the relationship in ways that make sense to us mm -hmm. and are in our interest as well and recognizing that it is not an alliance, it's a close strategic uh, partnership. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what Minister Jay Shankar has said is India does not want to be in a China camp or an American camp or subordinated, and they have positive relations, including with Russia. Mm -hmm. But in certain areas, they feel technology, they can be particularly close to us. And, mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, co-production of defense items, supply chain hubs, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But they uh, want to do it at times on their terms, which mm -hmm. makes sense for makes sense. any country and not necessarily on anyone else's terms. Yeah. I think particularly, and this brings us a little bit closer to the topic um, that this evening was advertised on, I think particularly in some of those areas that you mentioned, technology, manufacturing, a lot of these issues really do spin around China. And for a long time, people tried to say it's not about being, you know, pairing up against China. But, but in many ways, I think India has tried to fill that gap that is growing. Um, yeah. And in terms of both in terms of industrial policy and import policy, but also just in terms of capacity, how do you, how do you see that, those fields in particular developing? Well, again, to step back for a second, when the United States started to transform its relationship with India, we also had a cordial relationship with China, mm -hmm. as did India. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, India's not had a f warm and fuzzy relationship with China ever since the Chinese invaded India in 1962, but it has worked out a modus operandi and has worked well with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And so the foundation of our relationship was not based on concerns for China, but that always was somewhat in the background. But more recently, the strategic clarity about the challenge that China poses in the region has brought us closer together. Uh, this happened because in 2020, the Chinese suddenly went across the, there's no defined border between India and China, but the line of actual control and made incursions into India. And ultimately, there were casualties of 20 Indian troops, which were the first casualties in 45 years. Mm -hmm. And then you saw COVID, uh, situation where uh, China, everyone discovered, was a key component for critical supply chains and medical areas and, and other uh, key matters of manufacturing. And coming out of COVID, countries realized that, you know, before the COVID, you would work in the national security area and you never talked about supply chains. Now you do. Uh, and you want them to be with trusted partners that you can rely on. So, this has turned out to be an area where India has tried to project itself as an alternative mm -hmm. to China, and you could have supply chains based in India that you'd have more confidence in and less vulnerability than if they were based in China. Uh, they've also sought to capitalize on companies, Western companies, that have decided not to expand further in China mm -hmm. or to go into China in the first place and try to attract them to India. There have been some challenges in that regard that I can get into. But so this has been a fertile area. And, and as you mentioned, there have been initiatives for, uh, for semiconductor manufacturing uh, in India to work together on artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. quantum computing, and other 
critical and emerging technologies. In fact, the two national security advisors of the United States and India launched mm -hmm. an initiative on critical and emerging technologies. Mm -hmm. And this grouping called the Quad, mm -hmm. with India, the United States, Japan, and Australia, has also put together some technology initiatives. So technology, again, climate, mm -hmm. tech uh, matters, uh, are all areas where we can mm. continue to work together and promote the relationship in a positive way. That, that development, this isn't something we talked about earlier, but um, that development of the Quad, the relationship between India, the US, Japan, and Australia, that's something that's come up actually remarkably quickly and in so many fields and is fascinating to me to see how that changes the whole yes. dynamic. And it, it's sort of, I guess one of my, one of my thoughts is, you know, you talked about, I think of it as the, the new non-alignment, which is, I think the Indians call, you said, strategic autonomy. But part of that is also these new groups yes. like the Quad. And how, 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 how's India doing kind of balancing all that? And how are we doing adjusting to those new groupings and those new realities? Well, let me spend a moment on the Quad and then put the Quad in context with yeah. other uh, groupings. The Quad is this really unique grouping with three treaty allies, the United States, Japan and Australia, and one strategic partner, India. India is not an ally of the other four. And it actually first came together uh, when there was the tsunami in Asia in 2004, and these countries worked together to provide disaster relief and humanitarian assistance, then formed what they called a quadrilateral security dialogue in 2007. But the Chinese quickly complained. They thought this was an effort to contain China, maybe an Asian NATO, mm. and the grouping disbanded in 2008. And one of the important initiatives when I was ambassador uh, in, in government was to try to revive the Quad. And we worked on this with the Japanese in 2017. The Indians were a little concerned that Australia might not be uh, uh, in the same mindset mm -hmm. as the other countries. But gradually, we got the Quad revived in 2017 at the working level, mm -hmm. sort of assistant secretaries. We actually had meetings among ministers in 2019 and 2020, including face-to-face -face in 2020 during COVID. Mm -hmm. And then the Biden administration has elevated it in 2020 to the summit level, to the leadership level. It's been a grouping that's been careful not to deal with defense matters mm -hmm. so as not to uh, overtly antagonize the Chinese, but has worked in a whole range of other areas, cybersecurity, uh, technology, promotion, climate issues, uh, uh, supply chains, uh, maritime domain awareness and the like, and has really become an important uh, focal point for trying to build a constructive architecture mm -hmm. in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, but India also is a member of what's called the BRICS, mm -hmm. which was uh, initially uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, then it expanded to South Africa, the BRICS, and then recently expanded to six other countries, mm -hmm. Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, Argentina, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, there may be- Turkey? And, uh, no, not, not uh, Turkey. Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Argentina, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and India sees its, India is in a variety of groupings, some of which are not with the United States or the West, they don't view them as anti-Western, but they may be non-Western, and it's part of its own policy to be reaching out to everyone, to be mm. positioning itself as best well, as possible. And when it recently was the president of the G20, which is sort of the major economic countries of the world, it made itself the voice of the global south, mm -hmm. which are the less developed countries, the middle income and low income countries. And this is part of its effort to really be a player that can reach across uh, all uh, uh, spheres and, as I said, be a bridge between East and West and, and, and North and South and mm -hmm. be promoting a multipolar world, mm -hmm. which it feels the United States inevitably will have to adapt to more uh, as well. And will we and have we, do you think? Well, you know, the United States has sort of uh, been part of a, a U.S.-led world order and institutions that we helped create, I think we realize that reform is necessary. I'm not sure we want that reform with some of the countries that India may think are part of a multipolar mm. world. And so we'll have to see how that unfolds. Mm. I, I say to people that we're really going through a period of flux and fragmentation in world affairs that's not been 
seen since mm. the end of the Cold War when Jim Baker did a masterful job as Secretary mm. of State or the end of uh, World War II. Mm. And the tectonic plates of world stability are shifting. You have countries such as Russia and China that really want to upend the current system. India would like to reform that system. Mm -hmm. And how this all unfolds over the next five years will uh, affect generations to come. Mm -hmm. And it's still very uncertain mm -hmm. whether uh, China invades Taiwan, what happens between Russia's invasion of Ukraine, what that mm -hmm. does in Europe, how it affects the Indo-Pacific, mm -hmm. uh, what happens with Africa and uh, its tremendous natural resource capability and its needs and, and its rise. All of this is uh, sort of up for grabs mm -hmm. now and in, in play. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, India sees itself, and I mm -hmm. think correctly so, as an important component of that process. Mm -hmm. And we see an important relationship with mm -hmm. India as critical, some say consequential, to what mm -hmm. happens in this, uh, this century. Mm. It makes it a great time, for the, particularly for the students here, it makes it a great time to study international affairs. You don't know, you don't know what you'll be reading to next week or yeah. next month or next year. Um, you had alluded earlier to Ukraine, and, and it's come up once or twice, and I, I'd like to follow up a little bit on that. Um, in particular, because I was, to be honest, a little bit surprised. I recognize and have always sort of um, admired India's ability to, to walk the tightrope and remain strategically autonomous. Um, but given the importance of sovereignty issues in India, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China with Arunachal Pradesh and the constant fighting over maps and visas, um, I really thought those sovereignty concerns would, would come through and you'd see a stronger, more clear position on Ukraine from India rather than one that initially, I think, to Americans seemed tilted a little bit towards Moscow, now perhaps is a little bit more balanced. But I wonder if you could, you could talk about Ukraine and India's position. Well, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine really crystallized some of the limitations, perhaps, of the mm. U.S.-India partnership that people didn't fully realize before then. A lot of folks started to assume that we were allies mm. and that if something happened that we had a strong position on, India would have the same position. Mm. And India has actually had a long historical relationship with the Soviet Union, I alluded to earlier, uh, from the time it signed a friendship treaty. It purchased the vast majority of its military hardware from the Soviet Union and later from Russia. It now has 60 to 70 percent of its hardware from it, even as it sought to diversify increasingly over the years from the United States, Israel, France, and, and others. Uh, and it's been supported by Russia at the United Nations, and it's had a very close friendship without any conditions or uh, limitations. Mm -hmm. as, as I said earlier, even when we began to trade with India on technology, we put conditions as to how the technology could be used, where it could go, what the limitations were. Uh, when we sell sensitive military items, we have conditions related to it. Uh, Russia doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. And so it's been an important uh, relationship for India. And they also are concerned that they don't want Russia to get increasingly close to China. Mm -hmm. If China is India's number one strategic concern, they'd like to try to make sure that if they ever got in a conflict with China, Russia would at least be on the sidelines mm -hmm. rather than with the Chinese. They don't want to do anything that would further push Russia close to China. So when the invasion occurred, uh, I think there was some expectation that India would speak out, but it became clear that they're not going to publicly criticize mm. Russia. Uh, they have increasingly, with their abstentions, accompanied them with statements about the importance of territorial integrity, sovereignty, peaceful resolution of disputes. They can be read as criticisms of Russia, but they have not openly and will not, in my opinion, be openly mm. critical. And to try to press them publicly to do mm. that is, is counterproductive. Mm. At some point, the atrocities in Russia are so severe that it's hard to be supportive of them, but they may not be openly critical of them. Mm. That said, I think the Indians have realized that maybe the Russian equipment they have isn't that good. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be able to get spare parts that they wanted from Russia because Russia is going to need to do all the spare parts for its own equipment. Mm -hmm. Russia is not going to have the highest level of technological uh, capability because they're 
by the sanctions operating against them not getting access to certain technology. So that's why you've seen India increase its technology relationship with the West, want to do more co-production, wanted to make sure that it's not caught short in terms of its own military capabilities, ultimately trying to indigenize its military capabilities so that they produce their own weaponry and don't have to buy it from anybody. Uh, and so I don't think you'll see India openly critical of Russia, but I think they have to recognize in their heart of hearts that Russia is in decline. And it's going to be, I think, uh, in decline for a number of years, both because of the sanctions and because of uh, uh, what's happened to their economy due to the war. And that as much as they may not want to see Russia close to China, it may well be becoming increasingly dependent mm -hmm. on China. And while India will want to maintain a positive relationship, I think in reality they're going to be having to do things that will make Russia a, a more distant partner than it currently is. Um, and then one last question. Sure. I'll ask an, an, the uncomfortable question of the evening before we go to questions submitted by the audience. Um, but that's the current India-Canada situation, um, which you know, we just, I think today and yesterday, we've read about India expelling more uh, Canadian diplomats, um, really kind of unprecedented uh, accusations by the Canadian prime minister in the seat of parliament. Um, India very strongly pushing back. I saw again your conversation with uh, Minister Jay Shankar where he was quite cut and dried. Um, and I just wonder if you could talk about that as, as perhaps an issue, but also as perhaps um, emblematic of some of the challenges. Yeah, well, I'm sure most people know that the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, Justin Trudeau, stated that the a killing of a Canadian Sikh activist in Canada, in his view, uh, has credible links back to uh, agents of the government of India. The Indians have strongly denied this and condemned it. And what Minister Jay Shankar and others have pointed to is, a, is the broader context of the Indian-Canadian uh, relationship in which India has felt for years that the Canadians have not been adequately forceful in arresting Sikh terrorists, they would call them, or separatists who have been promoting the separatism of uh, or the, uh, what's called Khalistan, a separate state or country for the Sikh area in India known as the Punjab and have fomented violence and, and other uh, inappropriate activities, and India has sought to extradite people from uh, Canada. It goes back to when Pierre Trudeau was prime minister and extradition request was denied, and the individual who India had sought to extradite was ultimately found to have helped blow up a plane traveling between Canada and India. Uh, and so the Indians feel that there's been a history of Canadian uh, indulgence of uh, Sikh separatists in the Indian view under the guise of free speech and uh, allowing in a democracy uh, groups to uh, speak out. And from the Indian perspective, it's uh, coddling uh, terrorists. And so they have that context and they feel their own diplomats are uh, under siege in Canada. And so they deny strongly the allegations uh, but react even more viscerally because of this history mm -hmm. that I just uh, alluded to. Mm -hmm. The United States' position uh, has been that uh, they respect the allegations that are made, uh, and they have requested, and the Indians have agreed, that if there's evidence presented, they will cooperate in any investigation of it. But they've also indicated to the Canadians these are just allegations, and until something further is demonstrated, one has to give India the space to deal with the issue uh, as well. So in a certain sense, we're now in the middle trying to work with both our ally, the Canadians, and our strategic partner, the Indians, whereas I was alluding to earlier, the Indians often being in the middle of the east and the west right. and the north and the south. That's our turn. <laughs> Let me turn to some questions from the audience. Okay. Um, a question from Parish in the audience um, talking about um, 
how this is uh, and was declared during Prime Minister Modi's recent visit, the most important bilateral relationship of the century, perhaps. Where do you see it going next? What are, what, what are the next steps that could be taken? Is it uh, reviving talks for a bilateral investment treaty? Is it a free trade agreement? Is it uh, restoring GSP? What, where do you see a well, good you direction? Know, when there are state visits, uh, and this was a very positive one, and there was a tremendous number of accomplishments, but sometimes the rhetoric uh, gets a little carried away. It's a very important relationship, whether it is the most important relationship of the 21st century. It's one of the most important relationships, mm -hmm. I would say. Uh, and as I indicated, the in, coming out of the state visits, there were important announcements in the defense sector, the providing of uh, US technology to India for sensitive <coughs> jet engines from General Electric, the co-production of these jet engines in India, new programs to work together in innovation and startups in the defense sector, the sale of Predator drones to India. There were other initiatives in the technology area in quantum computing and artificial intelligence and semiconductors and investments by the United States. There were initiatives in healthcare and climate and people to people programs to increase visas, to open up new consulates. So there are a whole range of things we can and will uh, work on together. But one area that actually has underperformed, in my opinion, mm -hmm. has been trade. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is true that India's economy has grown. And when I first was under Secretary of Commerce, the level of bilateral trade between India and the United States was at 19 billion to way trade in goods and services. When I left, it was about 160 billion. Now I think it's close to 200 billion. But that is really not at the level it should be for the mm -hmm. world's largest and fifth largest economies. Mm -hmm. And ironically, one area that China has really dominated in the Indo-Pacific region is the economic relations. Uh, it has, I think it's the leading trade partner with virtually every country in the region. There are two regional trade agreements, the Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Program uh, Partnership uh, called RCEP. Uh, which India had been part of the negotiations for seven years, but abruptly withdrew before it was signed mm -hmm. uh, because they were afraid it was going to be dominated by China. But in fact, China now, with 14 other countries, and, uh, is a member of this RCEP, which enables China to really be the key player for supply chains in the region and keeps India out of it. And the United States had been one of the original negotiators of the other key mm -hmm. agreement, the now called the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement on Trans-Pacific Partnership. But one of the first things the uh, President Trump did was withdrew drew abruptly. I think it was a strategic mistake. I think this would have allowed us, if we were part of that agreement, to help shape the rules and regulations and trade in that region. It's now indicated to countries that were sort of not there in the same way that the Chinese are. The Chinese are now applying to be part of this CPTPP. Uh, agreement. And so both India and the United States, who and we don't have a free trade agreement between our countries either, and we've had a number of spats. You referred to something called GSP, the mm -hmm. General System of Preferences, which has been withdrawn from India for reasons required by the statute, because India's markets are not always as open as they should be. India is trying to attract a lot of investment, but it still has high tariffs uh, in terms of trade. Well, this is an area more broadly, that the United States and India need to have, in my view, a better regional trade strategy. We've launched something called the Indo-Pacific Economic Forum uh, that tries to deal with supply chains and, and other issues, but there's no market opening measures in trade, and so it doesn't have quite the oomph mm -hmm. that you need to help both economies. So this is an area where I think we both need to focus on. At the same time, trade is becoming more of a domestic political mm -hmm. Uh, concern uh, for reasons that countries feel their manufacturing bases have been hollowed out and we haven't always done the best job of retraining people and putting them in other productive areas. But this is the challenging area because in many respects, no one wants to have any military conflict in the region. Mm -hmm. The real fight will be in the economic mm -hmm. arena and here's still where the Chinese are, uh, dominate the mm -hmm. Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, staying on the China angle, a uh, question from one of our students, Brandon, which I'll uh, paraphrase a little bit, but he's asking a, a strong, as India has developed as a strong pole in this multipolar world, could that trouble or, or pose a challenge 
to Chinese efforts in the world, like the Belt and Road Initiative, et cetera? Or could it be that, in fact, a growing and stronger India, given some of the religious differences in the region, um, I think uh, I would think of Pakistan. He doesn't say that, but I do. Um, do you think that it might lead to the neighbors getting together and looking to China to sort of help defend them against a growing and stronger India? I, I don't think countries in the region worry about a growing and, strong and uh, stronger India. India has never indicated expansionist tendencies. It's never uh, claimed in maps that it, you know, uh, other p portions of countries are part of India. I mean, it has disputes with Pakistan uh, that have been longstanding mm -hmm. uh, overall. Uh, and in fact, I do think countries in the region see a strong India as a good counterbalance uh, toward China. And while India also wants to have a constructive relationship with the Chinese, I think the level of trust is such that it's never going to be a close, tight relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't think India will be viewed as a reason for other countries to team with China. I think most of the countries in the region, because of China's activities in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, on the Indian border, in mm -hmm. Bhutan, in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, worry about Chinese uh, hegemony mm -hmm. and are working not to contain China. And countries in the region do not want to have to be forced to choose between China and the United States mm -hmm. or China and India. They want to have productive relationships with all. But they would, help, would like to see maybe a strong US security <laughs> presence mm -hmm. so that they don't feel threatened by China, even as they try to benefit economically mm -hmm. from China. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, last question from the audience from Nahid, um, and it's interesting, it brings me back to 30 years ago when I first worked on India issues, um, which is, um, what is the United States doing differently vis-a-vis -vis India when it comes to protecting intellectual property rights? This has been an issue for a very long time with India, but uh, how are we working or what might we do in order to not see the same IP problems that we've had in the past or that we have currently with China? Well, I, to be honest, not being in government right now, I can't tell you what the latest mm. inside uh, negotiating scoop is on intellectual property rights uh, in India. What you often see in countries that are developing is in their early stages, they don't have a tremendous concern about intellectual property because they just want to get goods and they don't care whether it's been pirated or, or elsewhere. But as they start to develop their own uh, sophisticated technology and uh, intellectual property to become more focused on this. And I think one of the things that you're really seeing in India is an effort to try to elevate its techno technological know-how and capability to have more startup companies that are cutting edge in terms of the critical and emerging technologies. And I think this will naturally create an interest in India in having greater protection of intellectual property. One of the major difficulties has been in the pharmaceutical area where India feels that the intellectual property rights of pharmaceutical companies have made it very difficult for a lot of its population to get access to life-saving drugs. And so they've wanted, to, and they've led the world in sort of generic drugs, and they've wanted to be able to get access to this. And there have been some creative ways that uh, pharmaceutical companies are, are working with India in this regard, but it's still a challenge because the research that's required to develop a new drug it costs billions of dollars, and if you don't give the companies that undertake that some protection for the intellectual property they've developed, you're going to disincentivize them to do the research, mm -hmm. and there won't be any generic drugs in the first place. So it's a challenging issue. My hope is that it's one that the Indians appreciate increasingly, and my hope is as they try to work out ways to in the future provide vaccines to as many countries as possible and to take advantage of the U.S. capabilities in the pharmaceutical area and India's manufacturing capabilities, mm -hmm. they'll be able to address the intellectual mm -hmm. property issue at the same time. Yeah. That's actually one of the areas where we saw things really develop when I was there and when you were there. I'm sure it continued this, um, th this wonderful match of capacity on the US side and the India side. And when they work together on things like vaccines and vaccine distribution, it really can be quite quite game changer. Yeah, and the Indians feel that they can do that in other technology areas as well, semiconductors mm -hmm. being one of them where 
U.S. technological know-how and Indian res uh, human resources and manufacturing mm -hmm. capability can go uh, hand in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, the Indians would like, as that happens, to gain more intellectual property capabilities themselves. Sure, sure. reasonably enough. Um, as we r r bring this to a quick close, is there anything else that you'd like to say or the, the, any topics that we haven't broached that, that you feel are, are of interest? I think we've important? covered the broad uh, topics, uh, at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I would conclude by saying that what really is important, you know, countries, it's often said, act you know, in their interests and you, know, you, you don't have friends, you have interests. Mm -hmm. But I do think one of the uh, areas that does distinguish the U.S.-India relationship is that we have friends mm -hmm. as well. And there's a tremendous warmth and relationship mm -hmm. among our people. And I'll never forget when I was meeting with the governor of one of the states in India. At the end of the meeting, she said to me, you know, my most important investment is in the United States. Mm -hmm. I was saying, gee, does she have Apple stock? Does she have <laughs> Google? And she said, no, my children. Mm -hmm. And you see, if you look across the government of India, the number of ministers who have children in the United States is incredible. Uh, and there's nothing, you know, people criticize this country and complain about this thing, I think, but it's the only country in the world that people are banging down the door to get into. And the best thing we do is when we have students come here, diplomats come here, business people come here, they see what an incredible country it is and the fact that it doesn't matter what your last name is, it doesn't matter where you were born, what your circumstances are. In this country, you can be given the opportunity to succeed and it doesn't take generations, it takes just a few years, you're accepted into your community. And the more we have Indian Americans and Americans in India, the stronger the relationship will be. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Marianne, if, if I can just say a, a, a real, very sincere thank you as someone whose family is on both sides of that equation, the India and the US, but also for the work that you've done both as, a, as an implementer, a, a creator and an implementer of the Improving Partnership, but also as a continuing advocate for that um, continuing partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be here. Thank you. Okay.